I want to open up to questions. We've got two microphones. I have a bunch of questions myself, but I want to hear from people in the audience, and let's get a discussion going. Ira? So I want to um, ask a question about re-education through labor, not the question of what's going to happen, because you know, we'll find out what's going to happen in a few months. But um, what do you think the significance is that one of the first things that the new leadership announced, or let be announced, uh, after the 18th Party Congress is that they were going to reform or possibly abolish re-education through labor. And is it too overly optimistic to say that this is an example of top-down um, leadership responding to a bottom-up uh, desire? And that, uh, you know, on the one hand, maybe it would have been, some of us would have liked to have seen the leadership square off all forms of extra legal arbitrary detention. But this was a big one that's been around for a long time, and they committed themselves to do this very early on. What does that mean for Chinese politics going forward and for human rights? Is, is it fair to be optimistic, or um, should we be more cautious? I, I want to hear, of course, from uh, our expert, Professor Fu, but my view is this is a perfect example of the leadership really being at sixes and sevens. What happened? The new head of the political legal commission of the party, Mr. Mun, gives a talk uh, early on in the new year, and he says admirably, re-education through labor by the end of the year will cease to be used. Curious terminology people have pointed out. This is Ira Belkin for people who don't know him, a great expert on China who's now our executive director of the US Asia Law Institute. So he says it will cease to be used by the end of the year. Well, that's nice. Mung, however, isn't in the standing committee of the Politburo as his predecessor was. That job has been demoted to the mere Politburo membership. Meng is said to be more liberal than Zhou Yongkang, his predecessor, who was not an attractive figure from the point of view of human rights, and uh, many people are glad he's gone. But Meng's statement didn't hold up. It's not like this is an official policy of the Chinese government. This is not a statement of Xi Jinping, either with his party or his government uh, hat on. In fact, that statement sort of disappeared rather quickly from the media, and we don't know. Immediately, other formulations began to come up, and people said, oh, don't get your expectations up. Uh, maybe we'll modify this. Uh, uh, maybe we can't really do away with it by the end of the year. All kinds of other forces that really govern things in China, where you have a highly developed sense of politics, even though we wouldn't characterize it as conventional Western-style democracy. So I think this is a political football now, re-education through labor. I think some things will happen. They'll change the name, certainly. Uh, they, may reduce, they may reduce the duration of the sanction from three to four years to a year to 18 months. Uh, they may change the nature of the sanction to educate people more and exploit their labor. Maybe they'll make it less cruel. Maybe they'll change the procedures to allow lawyers uh, in uh, what will still be an administrative punishment. The critical factor will be, will they allow the decision finally to be made by the police, as it always has been since it was instituted in 1957? Or will they allow a court to review uh, every sentence, which would put a big burden on the court? And it's not like courts in China themselves are very independent. That's another big subject we can talk about. So I think it's a mixed situation where we really can't see. There will be some changes. I think prostitutes will exclusively maybe have their own training. Uh, druggies, the major people who get this sanction, will have their own training. They'll be shrinking as they have been the number of people subject to it, but it's still going to be there, I think. I don't think you're going to see an elimination of the ability of the police 
to put all kinds of dissenters, all kinds of people who want to take part in a more open society away. I think it's just happening. It's too convenient for the police, and the police are still more powerful, even though their position is increasingly being challenged. But I hope I've provoked my dear friend, Professor Fu. Okay, let me just disagree with you on that. Good. <laughs> just, for the, just for the sake of it. Uh, um, I, I think there, there, there will be political difficulties, legal difficulties, and the sociological difficulties. Uh, if you look at the re-education of labor, in a way it's a very difficult concept because it has all type of offenders. There are political dissidents, there are what is called the minor terror terrorists from Xinjiang, but there are drug uh, addicts, there are prostitutes, there are people who are subject in this country to the three strikes, you are out, those type of people. Right? Those are the majorities. It gets a bad reputation for two reasons. One is there's no procedure. Right? That is an easy fix. In China is easy to pass a law. If you say, okay, have a procedure which is authorized by law, and then you have, maybe have a lawyer, have a trial. I mean, that is straightforward. Tomorrow, the National People's Congress could pass a law creating a legal procedure to punish the same type of people. That's the end of it. I think that is e uh, quite easy. The difficult question, which is also easy, is what about, I think the, the, it has a bad reputation because it is highly political. You, whenever there's a crisis, then the Communist Party would say, oh, we have a good tool. Right? Uh, in 1996, 97, the Ministry of Justice started to think about reform. Right? There were drafts, but then in 1999, you had Falun Gong. They said, okay, we cannot uh, abolish that because we need to use them against Falun Gong. Um, and then more recently, you have the petitioners. You have waves of petitioners that went to Beijing. You cannot punish those people through criminal law. And then they said, okay, let's use now job. Right? But that is the political question. I, I think in a way, if you have the political will, it's straightforward. You don't have to put those people inside re-education for labor. But of course, the question is, as Jerry said, we well, use other names, right? <laughs> use something else. As long as there's a political need. As long as the police are so powerful, you can't always have an alternative mechanism to detain, punish people that you want to punish without going through the law. Uh, the, the good thing now, of course, is the courts are, in a way, quite stubborn. They say, we don't accept those cases, right? Now, you are not good enough for us. So you have, uh, you know, more or less a good criminal justice system in that regard, but then you create an alternative institutions for, for, uh, for other uh, outcasts which, um, which will be punished politically. So that probably is the issue. The main uh, sociological issue is what are you going to do with those non-political repeat offenders? Uh, that is the vast majority in the Naoja institution. Uh, you, they cannot be punished by criminal law but they continue to commit offenses. Uh, the Chinese way is three years, one and a half years. The Hong Kong way is, well, you know, you are the revolving door in, in and out. Uh, I think the American way is, you know, three strikes. So it's, it's difficult to, to say, you know, there are the different things there, procedural justice, and also the more substantive issues, how to punish better and more effectively against those one who are not political offenders, who are not young anyway. Right? If you go to the institutions, you saw people in their 30s and 40s, even 50s, they've been committing those minor offenses the rest of the whole life. But then what are you going to do about those people? Those are, those are the questions which I think uh, have not received their attention. The political side, I think, is quite easy. It's relatively easy to deal with. Please. And please identify yourself. Ken Wasserman. What are your views of the argument that China's closed internal structure has been helpful and maybe necessary for the amazing recent economic accomplishments of the country 
And is that relevant? I'm happy to take that on. Uh, look at South Korea. Uh, former dictator Park's daughter is about to come to Washington May 5th. She's now a successor to him. He presided over a horrible administration that really tortured, killed many people, including people I knew. One fellow had been my protege at Harvard Law School. Today, most people in South Korea regard themselves as the beneficiaries of his dictatorship. Not that they would endorse what he did, but they realize it seemed to have enabled enormous economic progress. Look at Taiwan. Same thing. Uh, you had a Leninist type uh, dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek and his successors who used that power to make Taiwan an economic model in many ways for smaller countries. In both cases, beginning in the middle 80s, that economic progress led to political change. And that political change has made possible impressive democracies in the East Asian Confucian Buddhist culture area, just the way Japan, with a similar background of Confucian Buddhist influence, managed the change earlier with American guidance, shall we say, and help. Uh, we have to look at China that way, and we have to say, Whatever the horrors of the Mao era, whatever the terrible things done since the chairman's demise, we have seen remarkable development, and maybe it couldn't have happened uh, under a more democratic regime. But now, it, maybe it's cruel to think that a communist leadership that has done so much the usual cliche now is to bring 300 million people out of poverty. Of course, that leaves quite a few hundred million people who haven't been lifted quite so high. But it's maybe cruel, having done all these impressive things, they have to deal with the consequences of their previous policies. And the consequences are people have reached a new stage and they're making new demands. You can't. Uh, what was there? Used to be a New York play, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. Well, the leaders of China can't get off. They're there and they have to cope. And they've created a lot of these human rights expectations. I wonder if they had to do it again. Would they put human rights and property rights uh, in the Constitution? Would they carry on a legal education system that's one of the booming areas of academic life? with roughly 700 law schools and law departments. When I first went to China, you couldn't find one that was open. And with an elite core of law professors who come here and elsewhere to train, who are really teaching their students to imbibe Western values that are being denounced by the leadership on the same day they're teaching about Western constitutional and other laws, the leadership in China has, in a way, created its own nightmare. And now there are these roosts, these, uh, what shall I say, chickens, to use the bird flu uh, metaphor, are coming home to roost. So this is, in a way, you have to feel sorry for them, unless you're acquainted with the continuing cruelty that they seem unnecessarily to inflict on so many good people.